Hola, welcome to No Mama, Grow Mama with Milady Stones, where we discuss all topics related to health and wellness. Okay, so this is part two of my wonderful chat with Ari Bretnell, my favorite baby wearing advocate and the founder of the Canadian Baby Wearing School. So if you haven't uh, checked out part one yet, this is a um, wonderful episode where Ari and I chat and fall into the rabbit hole of talking about the practice and culture of carrying our babies in baby carriers. Um, so this is just part two of the discussion. Um, if you ha again, if you haven't seen part one, go check that out first and enjoy. And I really want to highlight what you just said about, um, you know, what well, we were just talking about using the carriers at different stages of the baby's development and highlighting that because it's not about rushing into mm -hmm. different carriers or different carries because we want our baby to be, to be in different positions on our body. Right. It's about following the baby's age and development. Mm -hmm as a Absolutely. cue for when to change to something different. Absolutely. Are you finding that sometimes we rush it a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yes. Very much so. Um, because our baby is a special snowflake. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> we want our baby to be, you know, getting to the next stage a little bit faster than the other baby. Um, that's human nature. Um, we're a little competitive like that. And I do think that there's sometimes a bit of a rush to do that. Right. Um, particularly when people are also excited about maybe having the chance to purchase another product. Mm -hmm. Um, if the baby needs it, um, then that I think helps us justify a little right. bit. That's kind uh, of confusing though a little bit too, because I know for myself, I mean, each time I, with each child, I had to look again at the, the guidelines for like when I could flip to the back. But right. I mean, if you're following the, what the manufacturer guidelines, maybe it was, there was something more that I missed, it's kind of confusing because they'll say like a, an age marker, yes. say sitting up, but it's yes. like, we were talking about this at our course, what's the, like, it's not sitting up in the tripod position, right. it's that they need to be able to sit up and really be able to be steady in that position. So it's what, like, what does it look like exactly? Yeah. What does it look like? That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, and yes, a lot of companies used to include, some still do, um, an age. Right. So, you know, back carries from six months and up, hip carries from four months and up. Um, but what a baby at four or six months or whatever this, the age is can do is hugely variable. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a premature baby? Mm -hmm. uh, or is it a baby who is uh, maybe showing some signs of developmental delay? Um, and, and if so, is that baby um, kind of in the same safety position um, mm -hmm. as a baby who's developing kind of according to that predictable chart? But no baby has ever read the, you know, baby milestones chart <laughs> um, and decided to follow it. Right. Um, yeah. So what we're looking for, for, um, there's kind of two milestones at which, um, parents sort of want to start moving their baby or shifting the position that they're, they're carrying them in. Mm -hmm. Um, and one is to a hip carry. Um, a hip carry is so easy. When you start carrying your baby on your hip in arms, mm -hmm. you can do that in a carry. Um, and everybody who's ever tried to plunk a baby who wasn't quite big enough on their hip knows they sort of do this squishy, sad, off, off to the side. Yeah. And then your other arm goes there. Your other arm. Yeah. yeah you're holding so them not ready for the side. No, it's that. But as soon as you can kind of hold them easily in one arm on your hip, you know, they're ready to do that. Mm -hmm. So the hip carries really couldn't be easier mm -hmm. um, in terms of that guideline. Um, and also parents will really notice that speaks to how differently de babies develop um, and that there is no typical baby. Um, the age of that, I've seen babies from, you know, two to seven or eight months um, just start, you know, be kind of ready for that hip carry depending mm. on where they are. Mm. Um, so it, it really does vary widely. Um, you know, go to any mom's group and ask, when did your baby start walking? Um, mine were running really, really well by 11 months. Mm. Um, they couldn't speak. They didn't say anything. <laughs> right. Um, whereas, you know, you'll sometimes have the baby, um, who might not take their first steps till they're 17 or 18 months. Um, and that may or may not be considered a delayed or something that's 
you know, a problem. Some babies just focus on um, different skill sets at different time periods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we're looking at a back carry, most parents realistically don't back carry. Um, it's intimidating. It's something that seems sort of counterintuitive to them in terms of supervising their babies. Um, it's a bit tricky. Um, it definitely requires um, a skill set um, to be able to achieve, and it also requires some practice. Mm -hmm. um, so the average parent going and buying a carrier um, is probably never going to use them in that carry, realistically. Mm -hmm. But more and more people are. Um, and especially as more and more carries, carriers become more widely available that really comfortably allow for a great back carry. Um, that is sort of an achievement that a lot more parents are looking to unlock. Mm -hmm. um, and they're willing to put in a little bit of practice um, to get, you know, get comfortable sliding a baby around to their back. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the milestone for this, um, the recommendation that a lot of the industry is moving towards, myself included, um, is what we call the unassisted sit. Um, so an unassisted sit is a baby who is able to kind of get themselves into a sit on their own um, and maintain it. Um, so if they can hold their sitting position and have, you know, a sibling brush past them or, you know, the family dog or something like that and kind of bump them, but they're able to use their core muscles to sort of return to, to that center position um, and to stabilize themselves, that's a baby who is very ready for a back carry. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a really big aspect of it. The reason that that guideline feels most comfortable to me is that at the point that a baby can do um, a, a comfortable back carry uh, or can, can sit independently, um, that's a baby who's not going to slump in a carrier. Um, that's a baby who's not going to fall chin to chest in a carrier. Um, that's also probably a baby who will fit the carrier properly. Mm -hmm. Um, once they've reached that stage. Um, there are some other aspects of back carrying readiness that, that we want to consider too, though. Um, one is, is the parent ready? Um, because again, the majority of parents have a baby who's sitting unassisted and they have no desire um, to, to make that shift and do a back carry. So the parent, the wearer needs to be really ready and feel comfortable with, with making this transition. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one is, does the baby fit the carrier properly? Um, you can have a teeny wee baby who's very comfortably sitting unassisted, but still really not quite big enough in, in usually it's a buckle carrier to be totally honest. Mm -hmm. Um, actually it's always a buckle carrier. Right. Um, mm -hmm. where simply the physical body of the carrier is too large for the size of, of maybe a more petite baby. Um, so there are a few other things that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. So you started to talk about how babies will curl up sometimes and shift yeah. to the side. And, and my brain started to think about that, like visible and kissable yes. for people to watch for. Can we talk about that next? Can visible you... and kissable, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, so visible and kissable is a guideline that BCIA, my industry org, um, created in conjunction with Health Canada. Um, so there's a poster campaign. Um, if people are interested in accessing those, they're actually available on Health Canada's website. You don't have to be Canadian to use them. Um, we have lots of people internationally using that guideline. Um, and it simply talks about visible and kissable as our kind of safety guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, we know that babies are most at risk in all infant products, not just carriers, um, from zero to four months. Um, so we want to sort of work extra hard to educate consumers and parents. Mm -hmm. um, to pay more attention to their babies during that, that time period in every product that they're in. Um, but of course, we're here to advocate for baby carrying, so we're talking about the baby carrying industry and baby carriers. Mm -hmm. um, so what visible and kissable means is that um, a baby is um, at kissable height. So often you'll see babies that are too low down um, in a carrier, so kissable height you need like more camera space here. Right. <laughs> about here. What it means is that you can easily reach down and kiss the top of your baby's head. Um, if you have to lean too far down or you can't quite make that reach, um, that means that your baby's too low on your body mm -hmm. um, and they need to be brought up higher um, so that they are that easily kissable. Um, so it's just, again, that leaning down, can you kiss the top of your baby's head comfortably while they're in their carrier? Mm -hmm. um, visible, what does that mean? It seems obvious. Um, can you see your baby's face? Can your baby do well? Um, what visible is really about is supervision, um, that the baby's being actively attended to while they're in the carrier, um, and also that their airway is protected. 
um, so that their chin isn't slumping down um, to their chest and, and physically cutting off their airway. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And also that they're not covered. Their face and mouth and nose aren't covered with fabric of the carrier um, of, of your clothing. Um, maybe of a blanket, a nursing cover, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, so can you see your baby? Can you kiss your baby? Um, that's what, what visible and kissable means. Um, because that vulnerable period is zero to four months, mm -hmm. um, we're most concerned about that during that time. Um, it's never, of course, safe to not have your baby's face covered. Um, it, that there, there's no age at which it's safe to cover somebody's face up. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But part of visible is also can you see your baby? Um, and in a back carry, there are many ways to attend to your baby. Um, you may not be able to, sort of depends on your flexibility and how tall your baby is. Mm -hmm. um, you may or may not be able to twist around and, um, and see them on your back. Um, but there's many other ways to attend to your baby. Um, you can sort of reach back and pat them. You can feel them. You can feel them moving. Um, if you're careful with your clothing choices, you can feel your baby's breath. Mm -hmm. um, on on your back or on your neck. Um, I used to be able to feel my son's um, chest rising and falling. So as we were walking, I would attend to them by pausing for a moment, you know, sort of feel their um, their breath rising and falling on um, on my back or feel their chest rising and falling on my back. And I knew we were good, mm -hmm. you know, we'd keep going. Mm -hmm. um, so visible and kissable really does um, never stop being important. No. Um, but we really are trying to sort of get people to pay attention to what the meaning behind that message is. Yeah, absolutely. Is, you know, is your baby high? Are they tight in a front carry? Um, and um, are you able to attend to them? Are you actively attending to them? Yeah. Um, something that we know, um, one of the primary reasons people carry is so they can do other things. Right. While they're baby wearing. That's, I mean, realistically, we're not baby wearing just for the altruistic reasons of you know, connecting and bonding to our babies. We also want to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. um, we want to be able to, you know, get the dis dishes washed, get supper prepped, um, read books to our other kids, go to the playground, walk the dog, go to the grocery store, whatever our things are, exercise. Um, so if your goal as a parent is to get something else done while you're doing the carrying, um, it's really easy for us to get distracted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're on your phone, your dog is pulling you, you're trying to hold a cup of coffee, um, and your toddler is screaming that they need to have, you know, have their diaper changed. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really easy to not actively attend to the baby in the carrier, mm -hmm. um, particularly because little babies tend to fall asleep with them a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, the message that, um, that all organizations, all carrier companies, all, you know, baby wearing educators are trying to get across is use this as a tool, but keep paying attention to your baby. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. keep attending, pay attention, don't get distracted. Um, that's what, that's what we're going for. Yeah. It's something that I need to add into my instructing as a salsa baby's instructor, right. because I mean, I do talk to the moms about making sure that we're watching for the bobble head. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I talk about, you know, if, if you're seeing that bubble head going on, how do we modify our movements? But I actually, yeah, I'm like, I, I need to really incorporate in my cueing that like stop and, and check in yeah. with baby as baby's nose still up. They haven't done that slump forward or slump sideways. They're still breathing. They're still good. Yeah. It's something that we need to, because, you know, especially in an active class, like salsa baby PR, you, it's easy to get distracted. It is. And there's music like going. There's yeah. lots of other people. Um, yeah. it, it's it, it's not a bad parent who gets distracted. No. Um, it is a normal parent. We all will do this and we'll all do it a hundred times a day. Yeah. Um, but I really think when we're advocating for carrying, if we give that model of, yeah. you know, check in, stop, look at your baby and sort of do the, that checklist, mm -hmm. um, especially when they're in that, that zero to four month stage, um, that really makes carrying the safest place for a baby to Absolutely. be. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, because it is way more, you know, much easier and more intuitive to, to attend and to check in on your baby when they're right here mm -hmm. um, than if they're a few feet away from you. Right. Um, but sometimes because we're, we're not a carrying culture and we haven't done this, parents need those reminders. We all need to be, you know, sort of let's, how do we do this? Like during the course of a class, mm -hmm. um, do you do that quick? Let's do a quick check-in. Um, you know, it only takes a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, 
to, to do that check-in. It doesn't have to be a big, long process. No. Um, and it doesn't have to be something that interrupts what you're doing. Yeah. Um, it's just that quick check-in. And as soon as you make a point of, hey, how do you check in with your baby? Um, how do you make sure that, you know, their chin's still in that good position and, and that, that everything's okay? Um, and so many parents will tell you, oh, they just automatically do it. You know, after a little while, they don't even think about it, but they recognize that they are actually checking on the baby mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. Um, and I mean, as a salsa baby's instructor, you have such a great opportunity to model that. Yeah. Because uh, you're literally leading the class. Yeah. You know, people are paying attention to what you're what you're doing and following along. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're in a really good position too. Well, yeah, and I think I think sometimes I sort of thought as like. It's like navigating, um, like I, I always think about safety and trying to be safe with my moms and stuff like that. But it's like, sometimes you kind of get worried or I kind of get worried about interfering in the relationship. Right. Right. right? So it's like, I have to kind of retrain myself to, to know that I'm, I'm not, it's not about, you know, interfering with a relationship or like trumping the mom's intuition. Like it's just about those little reminders because we do yeah. get distracted. So. I'm glad that we're talking about that. So now my moms will know that I'm not trying to be like the know-it-all. No, no. <laughs> we're, just all, we're all helping each other out. That's what this whole series is about too, is like, you know, building this supportive network with each other and informing each other with more information. There's never too much information that you can think about, you know, consider, consider everything. You know, we don't have to be the know-it-alls and it's just about like, sharing information and take it in for yourself. What's true for you? How can you help another mom? Even if you had a different situation, yeah. maybe if baby carrying didn't work for you, doesn't mean that you can't support another mom to do. Absolutely. So, yeah. We're about this whole huge community. And I invite moms in my class too, to like, tell me if I'm doing something that could be different. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I think that what anybody who works with, with young families. Um, I know you see this every day in your classes. What we all pick up on really quickly is exactly how vulnerable um, new parents are mm. in, that, in that time stage. Um, they might not be certain. In so many cases, um, their baby is the first time they've ever cared for a baby. Mm-hmm. Um, you've never done this before, and it's an entire person, like a whole yeah. person, <laughs> and you're supposed to keep them alive. Yeah. You know, not just do that, but like turn them into a really functioning member of society. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's terrifying. It's mm-hmm. completely intimidating when you have no modeling as to how you might do that. Right. Um, that's it, it's really intimidating. And something that I love about um, about classes like salsa babies or, um, you know, the baby wearing, uh, meetings that parents might go to or other sort of ways that they seek community. Um, maybe, you know, the, the stroller size class that their their community lead, um, is that you get to see that other parents are in the same boat. Yeah. Um, other people are learning, other people are figuring this out too. Um, and you get ideas, you get tips, you get hints. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're in a bit of a leadership position, the way you are literally at the front of your classes, um, you get to model that yeah. uh, to the women in the classes. Like, hey, we're checking on the babies, not because I think you're not paying attention, mm-hmm. uh, but because we're all learning how to do this. Yeah. How do we monitor a baby while we're moving and there's music and all of this stuff is going on? Yeah. Um, even if you're somebody who's experienced carrying, experienced at baby wearing, you probably have never been in that situation before. Exactly. Um, you know, where there's a lot of extra stuff going on. So having that quick reminder of here's how we do this here in yeah. this situation. Right. Um, I think is respectful. Um, it gives people the tools to to monitor their own baby. Um yeah. I think we're all often self-conscious and we don't want to be that person telling somebody else what to do um, or telling another um another new parent what to do. Um, because often we've been there. Mm -hmm. And we've had an experience where, you know, I mean, there's sort of the stereotypical little old lady telling you that your baby is too cold and why don't they have eight layers on, even though it's 25 degrees above zero. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't want to be that little old lady. Right. Um, We don't want to be that sort of meddling stranger. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're all looking for community as new parents. We're looking for information. We're looking for ways to do this better. We're looking for tips. Mm -hmm. Um, And when you're in that leadership role in a community where you do get to model, 
um, and, and advocate for, um, you know, kind of respectful parenting, Mm -hmm. um, you're really in a great position to do that. Right. And I think things like, yeah, this is, you know, this is how we check on him on the baby. This is how we snug up our carrier, tighten it. Um, something that happens a lot, um, especially when we're moving is that our babies do start dropping down in the carrier. Hmm. Um, so they may have been at kissable height, um, say at the beginning of a class, mm-hmm. but 15 minutes in the baby slid down a little bit. So I think having, um, you know, the instructor having you do that reminder to let's scooch the babies up. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's get them back up to kissable height. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, that's what, that's what you're there for. Exactly. Yeah. Um, The scooching down, baby scooching down. Now my thought was, and I mean, it happens, we do shift a little bit, but majority of the time, are we not going to be staying in the same place? You know, if you're in a buckle carrier, baby's mm-hmm. mostly going to stay. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yes. So it depends on the carrier. Um, it depends on how well you tightened it. Um, and it also depends a bit on the weight of your baby, um, your own anatomy, some of the clothes that you're wearing that day. Mm-hmm. Um, if you've got, you know, like a slippery yoga top on, your baby might slide down it a little bit more than they would um, like a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. um, that has a little bit more grip to it. So there's a lot of factors. Um, and it isn't just the parent's skill set at using the carrier, um, that, that impacts that a lot of things can. Um, so in a buckle carrier, um, there really shouldn't be a lot of movement. Um, the baby should kind of sit in the place that they're going to go and it's not going to slide up or down, Mm -hmm. uh, a significant, a significant amount. Mm -hmm. Um, particularly if the carrier is well adjusted um, and also if the waistband portion is kind of seated in in the right spot where it's able to stay on your body. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people do find if they set the waistband in a buckle carrier, either too high or too low, that it moves around a lot. Um, So that's actually a clue. If your, your buckle carrier waistband is is moving all over the place, Mm -hmm. that it might not be in the right place. Right. Um, If it's having a hard time staying where you've put it. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So in a buckle carrier, not a lot of movement. Um, in um, a woven wrap or a stretch wrap, uh, particularly a stretch wrap, um, or a may tie, you might get a little more wiggle um, because the fabric of the carrier might pull, might loosen a little tiny bit um, as you're, as you're, especially while you're dancing, especially while you're moving around. Right. Um, but you can see this while you're out hiking or even just you know shopping in a grocery store. Mm-hmm. Um, you might have that same experience. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, specifically. Um, doing doing like a dance class or an exercise class um so if the baby's sliding around a lot it could be a clue that um again your carrier's not snug enough mm-hmm. uh, so maybe paying a little bit more attention to the tightening process as you're putting it on mm-hmm. um or in some cases say you have a four-month-old baby in a stretchy wrap um chances are the baby's just moving around too much because mm-hmm. the fabric is stretchy mm-hmm. and that can also be a clue that your carrier is no longer appropriate right. for the, the weight and development, um, developmental stage of your baby. Right. So it could be lots of factors, just a matter of, lots yeah. Of factors. Yeah. Okay. Fair try enough. the adjust. As a general rule, try the adjust, see if it works. If you keep adjusting it and the same thing keeps happening, it's probably not you. Right. Uh, at that point, it's probably just the carrier um, isn't, isn't the most appropriate. Right. Um, Fabric choices when it comes to wraps, woven wraps particularly, can really have um, a big impact on that. Some of them just really are slipperier than others. Right. Um, and again, you're you're dealing with a bunch of sort of interconnecting factors. You're dealing with the baby's clothing, your own clothing, the carrier, mm-hmm. uh, and sometimes the combination works super well, and sometimes the combination causes a bit of a slip. Right. Uh, can we move on to talking about carrier hacks? Yes. yes. I promise you I wouldn't roll my eyes and I didn't. (laughs) Um, Carrier hacks. This is, again, something that's a part of that sort of baby wearing culture Mm -hmm. um, that um, most people are never going to think to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And if somebody suggests it, they're probably not going to go along with the idea. Um, But carrier hacks, definitely a thing. They definitely happen. Um, There's a few kinds that we look at. Um, My general rule is we don't want to do that. the reason a carrier was designed the way that it was or that the instructions for a carrier are provided the way that they are um, is most likely that the manufacturer has tailored this 
product, this, you know, instruction set to the age range that they're trying to tell you to use this for. Um, so people are usually hacking to make it work for a baby that falls outside of, um, of that developmental stage or that age range or weight range. Um, and that's not the best idea in the world. Um, because more often than not, what we're trying to do is make a carrier that's too big work for a baby that is too little for mm -hmm. it. Um, and if we're talking about a little baby, we're talking about a more vulnerable baby. Mm -hmm. um, so let's not use carrier hacks with, with our most vulnerable population to get them to fit in a carrier that's not quite appropriate for them. Right. Um, a few hacks that we see, um, one that's fairly common is the rolled blanket. Um, there is one manufacturer that does advise that you can roll up a baby blanket and kind of make it into a little sort of seat and set that in the buckle carrier, set the baby on it in a front carry, um, and use this to make a smaller baby fit properly in their carrier. Um, they have also tested this. Mm -hmm. um, so the carrier will have gone to the, the independent testing labs and they will have rolled the blanket, set the test dummy on it, and gone through this process. Mm -hmm. um, no other company recommends this. Mm -hmm. um, I know very, very, very few baby wearing educators who are supportive of this idea. Um, carriers are specifically designed to, to fit around babies in a certain way, to tighten in a certain way. Um, and if your baby doesn't fit in it, adding a blanket is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, the rolled blanket might boost the baby up height wise, but it doesn't do anything to support the baby laterally. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no extra support for the baby along the sides. Mm -hmm. um, it may set the baby into a position where um, it might make it more likely that they fall out of the carrier mm -hmm. uh, because maybe it sets them in a place where they weren't really meant to be seated in that carrier in order to get them high enough. Um, and also too, most parents don't quite trust it. Um, it doesn't really feel that comfortable. They might follow the instructions, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel good to them. So they, they trust their gut mm -hmm. uh, and they don't go along with it. Um, some other hacks that I'm thinking of, um, never, never add a product, um, to a, um, to a carrier that, that didn't come with it. Right. Um, so there are some accessories that are, um, um, don't fit that criteria. Um, I'm thinking of things like, um, sucking pads mm -hmm. that um, parents can buy to put on their buckle carriers to kind of keep from having to spot wash constantly. Right. Um, the place on a carrier where babies like to suck. Um, that's not impacting the integrity of the carrier. If it changes the position your baby would be in in a carrier, consider it a hack. Um, right. If it's an accessory that goes on top, it's probably fine. Right. Um, but if it didn't come with the carrier, keep in mind that it wasn't tested with the carrier. Um, and if it wasn't tested with the carrier, you might change the intended usage. You might change the design. Um, so we don't want to, we don't want to hack carriers. Um, some other things that I hear of people doing occasionally are, um, taking like a little folded washcloth or towel, um, have a ring fling and rolling it underneath or a wrap, um, mm -hmm. to provide the baby with a bit of head support. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something people find is needed if they haven't tightened the top rail snug enough, right. um, to actually provide the baby the structure and support that they need. Right. Um, so if you're kind of, if you're a parent watching this, and you're feeling like I need to hack my carrier to make it work, um, sort of pause with that um, and try to figure out how to better use what you have um, before you start sort of adding things or doing those hacks and changes to try to make it work better for you. Right. So I know we did, we did talk about this. It came up in, in that baby wearing course that we did with you a couple weeks ago because you know, as Salsa Babies instructors, I mean, safety is incredibly important to us. We do have a safety program for new instructors coming on, so they know what to look for with carriers um, and to guide moms. And we, do, we have had situations where we've, you know, had an unsafe practice in class and we will stop and say, like, you know, in a gentle and most gentle way possible, you know, like, this isn't, this isn't going to work. It's not the most safe. Right. But then we, we did talk about the fact that there are those situations that come up Perhaps a mom has received a carrier that it was a hand-me-down or whatever. It's the only tool that she has and she really needs it for that little baby that's very colicky and she's, you know, having a difficult time. Maybe she, it's got a colicky baby. It's not her first baby. She's got a toddler to take care of as well, but the carrier doesn't fit the baby properly 
or we've got moms in our class sometimes that are that are socially isolated and they come to our class looking for community and it's you know perhaps it's the only option that they know of for something that they can join so we what we try to do is help a mom meet the mom where she is needing a carrier mm -hmm. and not that we like you know want to promote using the towel in the carrier but is there ever a time where supporting the mom is more important and, and and trying to enhance the carrier to make it the most safe possible yes is most optimal yes that is such a good question and i'm really glad you asked it i hope that i hope um, that it was clear what i was asking yes no i okay. totally know what you mean yes yes um our goal as as people working with new parents should be to support their their intuition mm -hmm. um support them um using the, the things they already have right um nothing is worse than somebody telling a parent yeah what you have sucks mm -hmm. uh, it isn't gonna work at all yeah. and you need to get something else right um because um that you know might just be what shut them down it might be what makes yeah. it um impossible for them to, to do that um I, I mean there's so many variables to this though um in some cases we're talking about somebody who's just you know being say given a carrier uh by somebody or you know found something um at um at a store somewhere and they don't really have a lot of sort of emotional investment or financial investment in it mm -hmm. and it's not going to work that well and you're not creating chaos by telling them you know this might not be the most appropriate and you might not get what you want out of it and it you know maybe best for you to go try to find something else mm -hmm. um but in some cases this is the carrier the parent has it's the one that they're going to use um what can we do to um to make that more comfortable for them what can we do um and i think as as carrying educators as people who are supporting um, and advocating for carrying um we can have some you know tools in our own toolbox to know that mm -hmm. uh, because in some cases it's really specific um i'm thinking of something um specifically like with a with a stretchier app um the pocket cross carry is typically the carry that goes along with um with that that's what a lot of people are familiar with until very recently that was the instructions that most people were provided with mm -hmm. um, was to do a pocket wrap cross carry um but they're hard to tighten they're not that snug a lot of the time um, a lot of the times the babies are sagging in them mm -hmm. um, so an example of something you can do is show a parent how to do a front wrap cross carry it's right. just a different way of pattern of tying um, but to do a front wrap cross carry in that stretch up and they're going to be way more comfortable in it um so that's a case where the kind of the half or the the you know different kind of thing from, from what might be typical um makes the product better Mm -hmm. uh, makes it easier to use, makes it mm -hmm. safer to use, makes it you know more appropriate, and lets the parent get more out of it. Mm -hmm. um, another example is with um, a front pack style carrier. Um, they're a little bit different than buckle carriers. Often they don't have waist support, um, so we've got straps hanging off um, off our shoulders, um, and they're only meant to be used sort of forward facing in or facing out. Mm -hmm. um, um, in a front carry, they're not designed to to be a back carrier for older babies. Um, a lot of the times parents, especially if their babies get a little bit bigger or um, if they have particularly long legged children, um, they might find that their baby's legs are hanging down and kind of kicking them and causing the baby to feel unstable and that pulls on their shoulders more. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something we call the scarf trick, um, where you just use um, like a scarf, baby blanket, really anything that's big enough to fit around you and the baby. Um, and use that to pick the baby's legs up, lift the baby's legs up a little bit and kind of secure them to your body. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of prevents that destable feeling or unstable feeling mm -hmm. um, and also prevents your baby's legs from kind of flailing around a little bit. Right. Um, doesn't interfere with the carrier use, doesn't interfere with the safety sort of features of, of the way that the carrier was designed, but lets the parent get a lot more use mm -hmm. out of the carrier. Mm -hmm. um, something else that um we'll often mention too is this might not work right now but it could work in a couple of weeks um babies develop and change so quickly so yeah. sometimes that thing with you know the baby whose head is too floppy or something like that is really just um a developmental thing and in a very short period of time it won't be a problem anymore. Right. Um, so sometimes we can just tell parents this isn't 
you know, really happening today, but give it a couple of weeks and, and you may notice a shift. Right. Yeah. That's good to know. I mean, yeah, hopefully we can help support people to just work with what they have. Ideally, you know, we want to be able to help people to get the product that's going to be, you know, the most ideal for the, for their situation. Yeah. But it really is about, again, the culture and, you know, supporting people where they are and <clears throat> helping you with what you have. Yeah. Let's make whatever you have the safest possible for you. And work for you. Yeah. Um, Cause there's a lot of steps involved to getting a carrier. Yeah. Um, you know, it, um, you and I are both in Canada. It's a big country. There's a lot of remote communities. Um, and shopping is not always the most easy thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, if you live rurally, if you're at home with, um, small children, um, even if you're in a large center with a lot of, of stores where you could access these, um, you might not be able to, um, you know, the process of taking three kids out to go shopping again, um, might be really, um, you know, not feasible. Um, I know when I had three small children at home, the last thing I wanted to do was take them out to a store. It didn't matter if I had the money or the time to do it. That just felt like too much chaos um, for, for me to do. So I think that we have to be aware that, um, you know, parents may or may not want to shop. They may or may not want to put time into researching a carrier. Mm -hmm. um, they may just have one and want to use what they have. Um, and I really think that um, one of our jobs as advocates is to help them do that. Absolutely. Uh, to, to figure that out. Absolutely. That seems like the easiest way. We want to meet parents where they are. Right. Um, we want to, you know, acknowledge what their circumstances and, and situation might be. And, you know, some people just hate shopping. Um, I, I don't understand this at all. I do I'm not sure. like shopping. <laughs> Yeah, we, you and I wouldn't get along in that, in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a shopper. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, all, yeah, so yeah, go ahead. I think that's all I was going to say. Um, part of, I mean, we've kind of alluded to this, the whole conversation, honestly, but one of my philosophies um, at Canadian Baby Wearing School and in all of my, my practice is practice, not product. Yeah. Um, that's something that um, we sort of created the concept of many, many years ago. Um, and, um, practice not product really means we're focusing on this, this practice. Um, you know, you mentioned, um, your, your Zimbabwean mom, just using fabric to tie your dolls on when you're little, that's practice. Mm -hmm. The product wasn't important. Um, you know, there, you didn't need a doll carrier right. um, to be able to do this. Um, when you go purchase a stretch app and, um, or, you know, find stretchy fabric and, and use that, that's practice. It's not a product. Right. Um, and also too, even if somebody is purchasing a product, you know, a buckle carrier or a main tie or whatever, um, the product's not magic. Um, if you don't have a bit of practice behind it, if you don't understand how to use that, how to make it work for you, um, it's probably not going to do a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, these are still interactive, um, you know, communicative practices. Right. Um, it's a parent or a wearer, or a caregiver holding a baby and using a product to keep them there. Yes. Um, but the point is that practice that you're holding your baby, you're keeping them close. Um, so I think so long as we always keep that in mind, um, are we achieving that? Like, are we trying to help somebody shop for a product? Cause that's not what I'm here to do. Right. Uh, we're not going to, we're not going to fix anything, make things better, help this family's life by helping them shop for a product. Mm -hmm. um, but we are by educating them on a practice. Right. So that's one of those things where, um, you know, if, if I'm working with a family who has a carrier that they're not finding is super, you know, appropriate for their circumstance, um, some things we can ask are, you know, does this carrier let you get your baby visible and kissable easily? Mm -hmm. uh, or do you really struggle with that in it? Um, are there some things we could do? Is this just a matter of rereading the instruction booklet and making sure we're not missing a step um, or making some kind of adjustment? Um, because truth be told, it's very, very rare that a product is completely inappropriate, um, where there's nothing to be done. That's, right. that's not that common. Right. Um, most of the time there's something we can do to help make it better. It might not be perfect, mm -hmm. but better is good. Mm -hmm. Um, and if better lets that parent, you know, carry another month down the road, um, then that's that much more connection that, that, that they've gotten them that much more, um, of the, the sort of reasons that we all carry that they've been able to, to enjoy and benefit from. Right. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I, I like to go. I like to go back to that idea of like again, it's about the practice because that's what really blew my mind when in your class was the it's the practice, not the product. It's about holding our babies on our, against our bodies, having that connection with them, and it's you know the the carrier is about holding them the way that we would carry them for extended periods of time, which leads me into talking about forward facing. Okay. Carriers. Because again, it's about holding the babies how we would naturally normally hold our children, our babies. So where does the forward facing come into that? Where did the forward facing come in? That's a really good point. Um, you'll often hear the expression in arms carrying. Mm -hmm. uh, so how would you carry a baby in your arms? That's, you want to find a carrier that mimics that. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to, um, to forward facing, um, that's the imagery that most parents have seen. Mm -hmm. like if you, um, if you see baby carrying in a movie, um, more often than not, that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I am blanking completely right now on what the movie is, but I was just watching a movie with my partner a couple of days ago um, where there was a woman, um, horrible boss too, horrible boss too. Okay. Um, <laughs> and super funny. Um, but there was a mother in it wearing um, two babies facing out. She had triplets. Mm -hmm. um, because of course multiples are hilarious apparently, <laughs> um, according to the entertainment is uh, industry. Um, so she had two babies facing outward um, on her front and then another baby, a third baby um, on her back facing backwards. Um, there is no carrier on the market today that allows a baby on the back facing outward. Oh my gosh. I know, right? Um, but that's really typical of the imagery of baby carrying that we see from the entertainment industry oh that we see from, babies, from celebrities. It's often completely outside what the manufacturer's instructions would have been uh, because apparently they don't read those when, you know, whoever the, the prop manager is, is purchasing these items. They're not looking <laughs> like, forget this. Let's forget this. Let's just like wear this. triplets because triplets are funny. Apparently. Oh. Um, yeah. So um, that's what people have seen. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're in your 20s and you and your partner are getting ready to have your first baby together, probably what you're picturing is scenes like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was another famous scene from The Hangover. Yes, where, I was just thinking of Carlos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Forward yeah. facing with the glasses on. Forward yeah. facing out. Or I'm totally dating myself, um, but an Austin Powers. Um, yes, mini no Or baby wearing Dr. Evil. Yeah. Um, or the mini me was in a carrier. Mm -hmm. um, that's the kind of thing we've seen. So even though it's silly and they're comedies and we're not supposed to learn how to carry our babies mm -hmm. from you know, these things, that's what the image we have in our mind. Yes. More often than not, our babies facing outward like that. Um, so some of it is, hey, let's blame the entertainment industry. Mm. Um, but the other is that we have this impression that we want our babies to see the world. And to participate in the world. And so a lot of parents really feel that if my baby's tucked into my chest, they can't see anything. They're not seeing what I'm seeing. Right. They're not participating in the same things that I'm participating in. So they're missing out. That perception is there. Um, and also, honestly, babies from about, I don't know, maybe three to five months really hit this hardcore stage where they want to twist around and look at something else. Yes. Um, and it makes sense that that is an age where developmentally they're able to see further. Um, they're able to integrate and receive more information and they're supposed to be learning. And the way that a baby learns about the world is by observing it. Mm -hmm. Um, so it does make sense that they would want to do that twist around and, and try to see something else. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of rhetoric out there about forward facing a baby. Um, we know that if you follow the manufacturer's guidelines, there's not a single thing wrong with it. Um, so we're looking at things like, first of all, most manufacturers are going to suggest three to four months um, because you want a baby who doesn't slump down mm -hmm. uh, while they're facing outwards. Um, or, well, you don't want them to slump down in any position, um, but while they're facing out, that slump seems to happen mm -hmm. a bit more frequently um, because they don't have the sort of natural ergonomic factor of your body and their body working together to keep their, um, their body upright the way that they do when a baby is facing inward. Um, so three to four months, we're looking for the baby to be old enough. Mm -hmm. Um, that is going to be dependent on the specific carrier. So we're going to want to look at the manufacturer's recommendations. Mm -hmm. Um, we never want a baby sleeping forward facing. 
Um, if they start to doze off, you're going to want to take them out of the carrier and turn them back in to face you. Mm -hmm. um, and also relatively short periods of time um, because um, that is kind of an awkward position, particularly for women, mm -hmm. um, to have a baby kind of pulling their, their postpartum body forward mm -hmm. um, isn't the most comfortable. Um, and um, they also tend to sit a little bit lower in a forward face. Mm -hmm. So you still really want to make sure that they're at that, at that kissable height for you because the higher they are, um, the more comfortable that's going to be um, for the person, the person wearing them. Mm -hmm. um, so under those circumstances, nothing wrong with it. Um, the last thing that we want to look for, though, is that the carrier was designed for it. Yes. Um, we see some interesting images floating around the Internet of people doing some crazy things with carriers that were not meant. Or yes. what doing. Yes. Um, but the good news is there's tons of brands of carrier with wonderfully designed forward facing out options. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's something that, um, that you're interested in as a parent, um, definitely make sure to look and choose um, a carrier that's specifically meant to, to include a forward facing out option. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's lots out there. So that's, that's an, easy, um, an easy thing to achieve. Right. But you're talking about it in terms of like the, the how to do it safely. And that definitely yeah. is, I mean, in our, in Canada, yeah, we have no laws or regulations against out, uh, outward facing your baby. So, and it, that's, that's how we come at it in our classes. We support moms to use their carriers according to manufacturer guidelines. Right. And then we support them wearing their carriers in their manufacturer guidelines to do an active class. Yes. That's where we're coming from. Yeah. But certainly, you know, we've had um, negative feedback from people because they see us, Salsa Babies instructors, allowing people into our classes um, wearing our babies outward facing. And there, because there is knowledge now that the recommendation is to not use an outward facing carrier, to not face right. outwards. So that's difficult to write. And I really wanted to make sure that I mentioned that because we're, we're not about, um, in Canada, again, like it, we legally, there is no, yes, the law. there's no law about outward facing. So let's talk about the recommendations that, what are they talking about? What are we talking okay. about? Okay. So what are we talking about when it comes to forward facing a baby? Um, very, very few people have, um, spent any time on any sort of baby wearing internet forum um, Facebook group, whatever, without getting the distinct impression that forward facing a baby will probably cause, you know, all kinds of horrible negative things to happen. Um, but the reality is there's absolutely nothing to base that off of. Um, it's all really, uh, that game of telephone that, you know, I heard passed on, I heard passed on, um, and there's just no basis in that. Um, we, um, have absolutely nothing to, um, establish, suggest, let alone prove that forward facing a baby, um, causes any damage specifically to their hips is usually the, the, um, sort of thing that's brought up as a concern, um, or the development of their spine or anything else. Um, the reality is it's not the most comfortable for parents. Um, it's specifically not that comfortable, um, for, um, postpartum women. Um, but most people don't find it the most comfortable position in the world. So it really limits how long they can carry comfortably for. Um, and, um, also the baby may not enjoy it for that long. Um, so you might have a baby who goes from, you know, kind of happily hanging out in their, their carrier and, you know, checking out the, the lions at the zoo, um, to starting to squirm, get uncomfortable, et cetera. Um, as with all things, as with any, you know, caring that you do with your baby, you're going to want to pay attention to them. Um, and if they're starting to communicate to you that they don't like this anymore, um, or that they're ready for a change of scene, go ahead and do that. Um, something that often doesn't get brought up either is that, um, a hip carry is often a really good substitute, um, for a forward facing out carry. Um, you can have a baby comfortably hanging out on your hip. They can still do that you know, owl like 360 degree um, um, head movement, they can see a lot more from the position of sitting on your hip. Um, and um, you'll probably be a little bit more comfortable, you can maintain that position for longer. And also if they fall asleep facing into you in a hip carry, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's not so not so bad um, for 
um, for them to be to be cuddled inwards um, and sleeping isn't a problem, whereas them being outwards and sleeping definitely is. Right. Um, but not to discourage people. If they want a forward face, again, there's lots of really great products on the market that allow that. Um, no reason not to follow the manufacturer's instructions um, and um, um, enjoy your baby. Right. Right. Yeah, it's been really an, an informative um, discussion. I, I'm, I'm really glad that we've been able to talk about this. I hope that, um, you know, this, this is a resource for new moms and to support them on their, you know, their journey of baby wearing. And even for someone like me, a baby wearing vet, there's still so much to learn. I, I can't believe that, you know, I've baby worn for six years, like I said, and been a salsa dance instructor for about a year now. And I'm still learning. But you know what? That's why it's a practice. We practice it. Yes, it is a practice. Yeah. Exactly. We practice it. Yeah. We practice it in an ongoing way. I, you know, mentioned earlier, I've been in the industry for nearly 11 years and there's still so much, so, so, so much to learn. Yeah. Um, I think in all aspects of our life, um, but this one particularly, whenever we feel like we've got it all um, and there's, there's nothing new to learn, that's when we should probably exit um, from, from that role. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a practice. It's something we continue to do, um, and, and continue to learn and continue to, to figure out things. Yeah, absolutely. Do you feel like there's anything else that you want to share or actually we, we like to end our, um, each episode by asking what are three things that you would like to share with new moms mm. or experienced moms, anyone, it could be a quote, it could be you know, something like summarizing something you've already said, three things that you'd like to share with um, listeners. Three things I'd like to share. I, I mean, know it's hard to limit. <laughs> I was going to say, how do we start? Okay, that's hard to limit. Um, three things that I want to share. I think one is, you know how to do this. Um, your body knows how to do this. Your baby knows how to do this. And you know how to do this. Um, we hear so much outside information that um, I think we often discount our personal you know, thoughts, values, feelings, that gut feeling, the instinct, um, but you got this, you know how to do this. Um, um, it's a Dr. Philism, but there's an expression to not substitute my judgment for your own. Mm. Um, and I think that that's something really, really important um, for new moms to remember. Um, the second one is um, that there isn't a product that is going to magically change your life. Um, there is no magic bullet or easy button. Um, it's, it's going to be you and your baby figuring each other out. Um, and um, if you have a partner, you and your baby and your partner are figuring out that, that new triad. Um, but the diet of parent and baby is, you know, ancient and it's, um, it's an important one. It's the most important one. Mm -hmm. um, and your baby needs you more than, more than anybody else. Um, and the last one, right after I said there is no magic bullet, um, I really do think that that being said, that baby carrying um, might be the magic bullet. Uh, <laughs> it might be as close to, to that as we can possibly get. Mm. Um, I've just, I've personally experienced how it helped me um, in, in my circumstances when I was a parent, or when I was a parent, um, when my children were small enough that I could when still carry them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now, now my kids are big enough that they could carry me. Um, at this point, I think we should do that someday. Yes, I think um, so too. This might be this might be a thing to be done, particularly for international baby bearing. Yeah, this is a tool that parents everywhere have used. Um, it crosses so many cultures. Um, it crosses um, every you know every possible continent. Um, there's actually a theory in anthropology. Um, nerd alert! Nerd alert! Um, but there's an anthropological theory that um, baby carrying may have actually been the tool that created humans, um, that the use of a sling was what allowed us to sort of develop into to what we um, eventually recognized as, as humanity. Hmm. Um, so it's possible. I love when people say, when did baby wearing get invented? Um, well, it didn't. It's possible that it invented us. Um, and of course, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and I don't think that that would be the case if it weren't as important and as key and as essential um, as, um, as it is. So it's something that I really um, I, I encourage parents to try to figure it out. 
Um, and if you had one carrier and, you know, didn't love it and weren't feeling it, try it again. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe try a different carrier, different stage or age of baby, um, a different circumstance. Um, and if it's not working, I really encourage you to get a bit of help. Um, so many resources, you know, go to a salsa babies class. You're going to find other parents who are wearing, yeah. um, go to a retailer that sells carriers. Maybe they, maybe they know a few tips and tricks. Um, there's, there's lots of resources. Um, maybe there's a, ba a baby wearing group in your community. Um, or maybe your neighbor or your friend at church or your, you know, aunt or your sister or something. Maybe she is one of these and maybe she could help you out. Um, figure it out. Um, because it's really, it's worth it. It's something that I can't ever under, sort of undersell on, on how much it can really do for families. Mm -hmm. That was a very long three things. That was a phenomenal <laughs> three things. I didn't, I didn't say you had to bullet point it. That was amazing. That's <laughs> awesome. That's an awesome way to sum that, that whole interview up. So I'm sure that there's some things that we've skimmed over a little bit. Maybe for some people, they would have died. They would like to dive in a little bit more, maybe yes. hearing more about the regulations and the standards or just connecting with you because you are a pretty incredible resource in terms of baby wearers and carriers. They're welcome to. That was my question. You're welcome to. Yes, okay, absolutely. Cool. So in the show notes then we're gonna we're gonna we can put in a little link to how they would best be able to contact you. Okay. What do you what's your favorite? Like Facebook or email or what do you think? You can find me on Facebook at Canadian Baby Wearing School. Um, we've got a public Facebook page. We try to respond to messages through there as fast as you can. Um, if you prefer email, um, apparently I haven't had enough coffee to say that. Um, <laughs> if you prefer email, you can email me at CanadianBabyWearing.com. All one word switched together, but we'll get those resources for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I'm happy to chatter about any of that. Um, I'm happy to um, connect with people, hopefully meet in person, um, or um, you know, meet somebody at a conference or, or event somewhere. Mm -hmm. So this is great. This is... Um, an open conversation. So I would invite any mamas, if you have questions or comments, feel free to ask Ari or, or write into Salsa Babies. It's an open discussion. Um, if there's anything that's triggering a little bit with baby wearing, because sometimes we, it take, we get personal and that's okay. Um, it's about having an open discussion. So please do feel free to um, comment into us. Ari, thank you again so much for um, meeting with me today. Despite our technolo technological issues. Technological difficulties. Yeah. I'm so happy to spend the time with you again, yeah. the lady. I'm okay. happy to chat with you whenever you want to. Absolutely. Thanks so much. We'll chat again soon. Take care. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.